start up, we'll start up in the parish hall talking about how we serve children in about two minutes. So grab your cup of coffee and that little snack that's right there and come in and we'll talk about our next generation. I was going to share with you all one of my favorite prayers that is for children, but it's in the prayer book and I don't have it memorized. And believe it or not, there's not a prayer book in this room that I can find. So we'll have to make it up. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for the many generations that call this parish family home. We pray that in each and uh, every person in all of the ages, we might ever glorify you and grow in each moment uh, to know you, uh, to love you, and to serve you. We pray that we might ever lift up the generations that follow, and um, that your name might be glorified to the end of ages. These prayers we offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right, so we're trying something new in that usually when I give uh, presentations, I have a computer uh, right here so I can keep track of what I'm doing, but Nicholas has changed all of that on me, um, and so I'm trying to figure it out as I go, but I should be able to advance slides, and I can do that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. This is part of a series uh, that Nicholas has put together on service. Uh, last week, we talked about, uh, well, my children, Howard and Nora, talked about how they went to go serve uh, widows and orphans in uh, Tanzania. Um, in, in the weeks to come, you'll hear about how we uh, serve one another through welcoming and connecting one another to the, to the church and to ministries. I mean, you also hear about uh, Habitat for Humanity and how we serve those in our community who need homes of dignity. Um, so for today, we're talking about uh, children and youth, um, and we're doing so, um, why? Um, 
because I don't get to talk about the depth of what we offer here at Trinity by the Cove probably often enough, um, because what we do offer children and young families is remarkable. Um, it's unique here in uh, Naples and really in Southwest Florida. Um, the space even that we offer to children on that whole wing shows how much we as a parish family prioritize um, fostering the faith of the generations to come. Um, so uh, with me is Linda Gimmer. Hello, Linda. Um, Linda has been working with me on children, youth, young families uh, for 14 years now, and she was here before I got here. Um, so she is our expert um, in um, how we um, guide children through infancy uh, up until uh, their teenagers. Um, you all may or may not heard uh, have heard of the curriculum, basically, we offer, or the way of being, probably a catechist would say, but it's called um, Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Um, and Lynn is going to come and tell us how it really is very unique and a little bit of the history about it. Unique is, <clears throat> unique is the good word, because um, I think what we grew up with is, as a Sunday school was very much knowing about God and knowing the stories of God. And Catechesis of the Good Shepherd gives us time to be with God, to know God, to know Jesus. And I think that's really a different approach because children stay in the middle. Children have that as a foundation. So their relationship is with Jesus, the good shepherd, as they go through all of their formation. Um, the, the approach comes from Sophia Cavaletti, who was a Hebrew scholar, and Gianna Gobi, who was a Montessorian. So we take the scripture that Sophia knows so well, and Gianna, who knows the child, who knows methodology of how to present things to children, and the two have created Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. It's like 80 some years. Uh, and so when it came to Trinity by the Cove, it was a big commitment. It's a commitment to children, it's a commitment to space, and it's a commitment to being different and unique. We do not, in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, talk about the Old Testament stories until they are in level three. There are three levels. The first level is the three to six-year-old. They all get to be in the room together because they're all very similar, right? They all like the same thing. They all develop at the same rate. And then level two is for the six to nine-year-old. That's our first, second, third graders. And that's that moral development. It's not fair. Um, that whole unique child <laughs> is in our level two. And then level three is when we introduce the Old Testament and we talk more about Moses and Abraham and the whole timeline of the history of the kingdom of God. So in those ways, it's different in that the curriculum is forever, right? but it's unique to what, who's in the room with you. We do not follow a written curriculum, we follow the child. And there are things we share with the children, but it's very important to follow the child, right? Now that's very freeing for the catechist because I'm not the teacher, right? I'm not the boss. I'm not the one who has to make sure everything goes right. I just have to prepare the room. When the room is prepared for the children, the children know how to move and the Holy Spirit knows how to guide. So that is um, one of the unique aspects, I think, of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd is it takes the teaching out of it, it takes the education out of it, and it puts the Holy Spirit in it and formation, not just for the child, but for those of us who serve the children. It is uniquely formational for us as the adults as well. And then we just started a toddler age. It's really not the atrium, so to speak, but we're trying to get it more developmental. So our nursery, when we got the new nursery, we did set it up to be very um, developmental for the child. So when they come, it's not babysitting, it's not just playing, they're actually learning without a teacher teaching them things. So I think that's kind of the biggest differences. Um, and we're gonna go back and forth. We have sort of notes about what we wanted to cover, but your, your questions are more than welcome. When I first came here, um, I, of course, grew up in Sunday schools the way probably many of you did, which is a craft and Noah's Ark. And I can't say I really learned anything else. Um, but when I came here and um, catechists, and Linda's very good about speaking about that Montessori and being uh, led by the child, that's not really my parenting style, um, right? So 
um, I'm not led by my children. Um, I really do teach and guide them. And so, you know, for me, when I was uh, coming to understand more about catechesis, that was a little bit of a hurdle. I'm like, well, what are we going to actually teach the children? Are they going to grow? Like, or are they just wandering around a room? Um, so I, I, want, um, I, I want Linda to talk a little bit about this work. So when she talks about how the room is uh, put together, uh, when you go into these, these atria, we don't call them rooms, we call them atria because it's sacred space, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But the content that is in the room is remarkable. And as the children interact with it, that's where I see the Holy Spirit really moving. So maybe you could talk a little bit about this work and then how it changes through the atria. But you have to come right here. <laughs> so our level one atria starts with relationship. A three to six year old loves relationship. That's where they're at. That's the best place to start, right? And so the best scripture to give a child who is three is the parable of the good shepherd, right? He knows their name. They follow him. Um, he loves them. He, it, it's a beautiful work for the children. And so we don't read, well, we do read the scripture, but we only read the scripture and we share this work with them. This is a hands-on work. When you put your heart and the scripture, your head together, and then your hand touches something, that's formation. When you've got the Holy Spirit moving your heart, head, and mind um, with that work, that's that's where you see the spirit move. So in Catechesis of the Good Shepherd in level one, they hear the um, parable of the Good Shepherd, and they hear it throughout and throughout. There's even a point where, and it, it, it's also here, that the Good Shepherd invites the sheep to the Eucharist, to the table, to the altar, right? And so the sheep go to the altar, and then you change out the sheep for people. And that's just one of those aha moments. Well, for me as an adult, I learned it as an adult, but the children get that, you know, by the time they're five, I'm the sheep, right? And so here we've got in level two, we're now in the whole world. We're not just in, it's all about me, which is the three-year-old. So when they change the sheep, they're actually putting international children because it's, they're international children from all over the world to let them know that they have already discovered this is for all people, all the people before me, all the people that are still yet to come. And so this work not only pulls them together in a relationship with Jesus, but it now goes out to the world. And they're the true vine. And so, you know, it's living on the vine and branching out and not just staying. And what happens to the sap? What happens to our branch? And so that's for level two. And with that is also the good shepherd. But we also at level two add the wolf and the hireling, which is not given to the three-year-old because we don't want the wolf scattering the sheep when they're just falling in love with them. But at the moral development, you know, that child who is, it's not fair in moral development, the wolf and the hireling is a great way to introduce evil, evil in the world. And yet the Lord is always with us. The good shepherd is right there. And so um, that spiral is what it is. It spirals. And then in level three, not only do they um, really look into that parable, but then they start to look at Ezekiel, right? where it all, it didn't all begin, but that's where they mentioned, I am the good shepherd. I will come and feed the sheep. And we start looking throughout the whole Bible. They like to read now and they love to research when they're fourth and fifth grade. And so we take the good shepherd work and we take it as deep as they want to go. They even one time wanted to know the different kinds of sheep, right? So, okay, we'll, we'll look at all the different kinds of Suffolk, Suffolk sheep. And, but it's one of those things that, this is where we start, and then we follow them, right? And we give them time to work that because it's their work with the, with the material that draws them into their relationship. So you can see how that's really reassuring to me. It's not just the child wandering around, although they do wander. Um, the content that is around them, these works and parables that are geared to the developmental age of the child, very special. Um, and as uh, told you there was going to be trouble, I did it on purpose. There we go. 
Um, we work on this from infancy. And so as um, Linda mentioned, when we uh, expanded this space, uh, this parish hall, one of the things that had to be done as a precursor was to move the nursery. So uh, the design of the nursery was intentional in all of the furnishings to already begin that Montessori approach to Sunday school um, and that introduction of the Good Shepherd even. I think that work is in there. Um, so the little list of children is there. Um, it's nursery care at Trinity is not just on Sundays. Um, we also have a mom and dad's morning out that is every Tuesday from nine to noon. Um, that comes to us, and I have a little bit more about history, I think, in a following slide, don't I? Um, so the, the ministry to children at Trinity has gone back to its uh, founding when we had a preschool here. Um, and we, we looked to, to see, did we want to do a preschool again? What does that look like? Where we ended up was there's so many government regulations um, that we didn't want to do a preschool, but we did want to offer something for moms and dads who are stressed out, who need uh, some time to drop off their kid. Um, so on Tuesdays, they're about, what, eight to 10 families now? Eight to 10 families drop off their children. Uh, they enjoy those hours in the sacred space already planting the seeds of uh, the parable of the Good Shepherd. She also mentioned that our nursery staff, I don't know all of them, but at least uh, our nursery director has been trained in catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about training here? They've all been Training um, is 90 hours. I, I'm trying to switch from training to formation because it's a formation for the adult on how to work with the materials. What's the doctrinal content behind what we're trying to speak to? And that is 90 hours for the first level. And the catech the nursery, it was really fun. They're, they've all been formed and they've gone certified through the training. And they wanted their name tags to say catechist on them because they feel like they're the beginning of where the children start this catechesis. And it's true, but they're the ones that realize that. So that, that was just a real aha moment for all of them. We've also had um, trainings here. We've had um, members of the parish, and I see Carolyn back there, who have taken it just for their own formation, right? They're not going to work in the atrium, although she does volunteer in the atrium. Um, they just want to know what it's like. It is a type of deep Bible study, right? It goes very deep into the things you would want to be as a child. You know, let the children come to me. Okay, now you can hear this as a child, not childlike, but as a child. And so that formation we have here, um, and we've also gone abroad, not overseas abroad. Um, level two is usually somewhere in Fort My. Uh, Fort Lauderdale. Fort Lauderdale or Largo. And level three is so rare for people to commit 90 hours, 90 hours, and then another 120 hours for level three that they usually fly far away to Texas. Even Alaska has a course. So it is a commitment of time, but the formation that comes from that. And I see Diane over here too, who's gone through quite a bit of the formation um, to be formed in order to be certified. And certified is just a way to say, um, you've gone through that training. We have people in the atrium that have not gone through that and they still love it and they still fall in love and they still follow the child. Um, but you get a whole lot more through the training as far as your own personal development, and how to yeah. guide that child. I know, see? help me, help me. Cool, um, it's not a teacher, it's a... One of the neat things about um, catechesis of the Good Shepherd is how it bridges um, the time in the sacred space in the atrium with worship. Um, and um, Linda's going to share a little bit about some of the works um, that the children do. And then I'm going to share a little bit about other resources um, that we brought into play. So the work spiral throughout. Probably the first one we share with a three-year-old that they love and never stop working with are the altar works. So in the atrium, we have a model altar. It's the child size. All of the furniture is the child size. And in that, they learn the names. Children who are three, four, and five want the names. What's this? What's this? What's this? So this is a patin. This is a chalice. This is a ciborium. This is the tabernacle, right? These big words, they love it. I learn it. And then they go to church and they see it. So it's one of those bridges from in the atrium to over in the church. Plus 
We have our altar guild helping us, right? And we have the priest. Marcella gives us an altar tour. We go there and she shows us all over. So there's a great connection, not just with the liturgy and our work, but with the parish family who is involved and they see that. Um, another one is the vestment work. This is really, it's the chasubles, right? I didn't know that either. And they have liturgical colors. Children love colors. So we give them the colors of the year. And we, we have a prayer table. We change from purple in Lent to white for celebrations, red for Pentecost, and green is the growing time. So they're not just knowing those colors. Now they're setting the prayer table with the proper cloth. They see the um, chasubles that the priest wears. So they come over and say, Father Edward had green on today, right? So they notice. And those things I think are really um, exciting for a child to know how to connect that, to spiral that and make that. And then the Eucharist, which I, uh, the altar spiraling up to level two, then it's not so much about the names of them because they know them, it's the order. What order do you put those all in? What order does the priest put all that onto the altar? And that's like a, whoa, do you know all that? I mean, there's a big long tablecloth that all goes down. And then in level three, which is where Diane was, it's like a dominoes chart. It's this big chart with 50 different prayers that are said during the Eucharist. And they read each one and they go, this one is the liturgy of the word. It has the gospel. It has the sermon. Oh, this is communion. And they, so they know every piece and it all comes from the book of common prayer so that when they go to church, they're hearing the same words they hear in the atrium. And now they have a visual and they've also worked with it. And those fourth and fifth graders love those little pieces, right? It's not just about this. They don't want this, right? They just want this in one thing or two. So that's a big difference in how it changes over at the atrium because we have to meet the child. And um, the one other thing that's here is the chrism work. So there's a work on- Oh, wait, let, let, me, let me talk about that okay. in a second because I can set you up for that. Um, the uh, other piece that, um, you know, when I came on board, so I wasn't a trained catechist, um, but I was uh, the associate rector with a special uh, emphasis on young families. And so when I came in, it was, how are we gonna help young families grow? Um, and a piece of that, which you all see every Sunday is the My Church bag. You can see them over there. Um, so in seminary, they called them a quiet bag, which terrible. We don't want children to be quiet in church, just to be quiet. We don't wanna, you know, and we'll get to how we can foster children in church better. Um, but. How do we create in that my church bag an environment um, where the child takes this bag and is with their parent um, and make that a, a bridge from catechesis to church rather than something completely different? Um, so Linda and I sat down at Amazon.com. We looked at this thing and that thing um, and how to print, bring all these pieces together so that children are tactile, they're feeling things, they're, they're, there's beauty. You can see how much beauty there is in the atrium. Um, and also, um, I am a sneaky priest often because I always want to teach the parent through the child. Um, and so uh, I came up with my church books, which um, there's one in every bag, and I I had some more time, I guess, back then than I do now. Um, but I have a, there are a couple of different ones based on the seasons. But the first two were my church and my sites book. So most my church and my sites. So uh, I wouldn't say most. Many people don't know what a ciborium is. Other people do not know where the word amen comes from. And these are the same people who are my age who grew up with Noah's Ark and a craft instead of something like this. So as they're reading my church books with their children, they're learning what a corporal is, what a Paul is, what a veil is, what the Book of Common Prayer is. Um, and so it's just another way that we bridged um, that atria with worship. Um, the bishop, uh, new, we have a new bishop, Bishop Scharf, uh, came on board, and one of the things he wanted to change in the diocese was uh, there's something called the chrism mass. And that's when all the priests go up and it's uh, just priests really and a couple of other folks who happen to be at the cathedral. And that's where all the holy oil is blessed. And then the priests bring that back to the parishes and use it. They use it for baptisms and use it for healing. 
Um, and the bishop was thinking, I want to make this more visible in the parishes. So when I come for my visit, I want to um, bless the oils then. Your turn. We have a work in the atrium level three that is actually the chrism, the chrism liturgy. And so they've had the chrism oil in level one as a three-year-old to make the sign of the cross on foreheads. They know what that oil is, right? And they do that again in level two. So in level three, we made chrism. We took the recipe and Father Edward and we're all just kind of making that together. There's a slide further in there. And so the catechist is guiding the children, measuring teaspoons and it was phenomenal, right? Because then <laughs> they presented the chrism oil up at the altar to the bishop who then blessed it. And it was very moving, obviously, that they that they were a part of that and that they saw that, right? It's not just doing it, which is a big thing in the atrium, that that's something that's going to form them. Then they also took it to church. They were in church. They heard it in church. They met the bishop. And so all of that is just one big spiral from three years old up to the 10 and 11-year-old. And I think that's the beauty of the program is the spiral. And it links both the atrium to the church. And it links back to the, if I can go backwards, the altar and the Eucharist works. They also at three hear the um, scripture of the Last Supper, the Last Supper. And there's this aha moment when you just watch, you light the candles on this um, diorama thing and you light the candles and you just look at those 12 disciples, right? All sitting around the table with the chalice and the patent and the candles. And it's like, it, it's, it, it, <laughs> it's very moving and it's very deep, right? That just isn't something that they've um, seen once they work, they go back Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and set those disciples up. They work with it. They put them there. They say, Miss Linda, will you come over and light the candles? Right. So, cause they can't light the candles. So it's again, one of those, here's the scripture. Here it is in our liturgy. And now you work with it, with the Holy spirit. And that's formation for a three-year-old. Um, and it was a neat moment in terms of uh, children and their work and bridging over into the church. Um, but also for me as the rector, um, this church has more young families than just about any Episcopal church, probably in the whole diocese. Um, and so to have us be able to listen to the bishop and hear and then do what he says made me really happy. <laughs> Um, this is a picture you'll see on one side, a bunch of shoes, and on the other side, children at a prayer table. Um, and this gets into the whole reality that it's not a Sunday school classroom. Um, it's an atrium. And, you know, it, there's a vocabulary problem when I get up and make announcements because I want to say children go to your atria. But I know that most of you are like atria. What are they? Do? Aren't they going to Sunday school? Um, and so the whole idea of children formation, catechesis of the Good Shepherd and atria uh, take some vocabulary work. And that's why I'm glad you are here. So next time I'll try and say children go to your atria and you will be the only ones who understand that. Um, but I, I want uh, Linda to talk a little bit more about the environment and how it's prepared each Sunday. It is. So you will see the children running around, having their snack, playing in the courtyard, um, running around is what they do. And then they get to the door of the atrium and they take off their shoes. This is holy ground. This is a transition. And they come into that atrium and you will not believe they're the same children. They're calm. They're peaceful, they're engaged, they're prayerful, they're contemplative. And how does that happen? The place is prepared for them. There's only things in there that nurture that. We assist them to have a prayerful life. We have a prayer table. We always meet at the prayer table, some at the beginning, some at the end. It's where we sing. It's where we say what we're thankful for. We set it with the prayer cloth. And that's the center, that and the good shepherd are the center of the atrium. You can't not go. It's such a beautiful thing. And then the works are prepared. These, they're handmade. Every one of them's made. Some of them are glass. They're beautiful. But they're going to take care of them because we expect them to. 
right? It's their gift. It's a gift from you all to them. And we tell them that. And it's one of those things that they take very carefully. There's also a work called Practical Life, where they're pouring beans back and forth, right? Or they're spooning rice back and forth. Well, that's very contemplative. I mean, to pour beans back and forth, you think nothing is happening. But in one of the slides up here, we have from pouring water in Practical Life on a tray that you have to carry to a table. Now they're pouring wine back and forth to get the cruets ready for the Eucharist. It's not blessed wine, but it sure does smell great. It's something they'll see again. And it's very peaceful to not just have practiced that and calm them down, but now it goes somewhere else in the atrium and they see that link just within the atrium. It's a prepared space. If anything goes wrong, it's the catechist. I don't wanna say problem. It's our work to change the atrium, not the child. There, it, it's just, and it's amazing. You know, if there's a work being mishandled, you either say something or you take it out, but you don't put them down. You don't say you can't do that. It's all in the environment. And that's um, not just beautiful, but it's what they work with and who they become. So when they go to church, it's that same contemplative, um, quiet, peaceful time. And yet you'll also see it at home. Um, we had one child set up a prayer type. Now they might've all done this, but one came and showed me the picture of the prayer table they set in front of their aquarium so they could watch the fish swim back and forth and then pray. So it's another one of those, if we set their rooms correctly and we expect and give them beautiful things, they are so very capable at three, at three. And then by the time they're in fifth grade, um, it's just who they are. It's just like, I want to do that. And then by the time they're youth, they're serving, you know, as Crucifer and Acolyte and it just keeps going. Absolutely. Let's see what we have next. Well, we have about 15 minutes. We have to go a little bit faster, but we're having fun. Um, we talked a little bit about how uh, catechists are formed. So Sunday school teachers, uh, you all might have remembered, who wants to be a Sunday school teacher? And it's everybody sort of grumbles and said, not me, um, but maybe I'll do it this Sunday. Um, catechists are um, trained, they're formed. Um, and through that uh, formation, through those hours of training, their training, um, they learn, you learn and grow, you learn all of these works. And so the time that you didn't have uh, when you were, or the time that the church didn't give you in Sunday school when you were growing up, or the time that you didn't have maybe uh, when you were just getting your career started, um, you all now have that time. So using it to go through uh, catechesis uh, formation training is a way to grow um, in usually all those questions that now you're too afraid to ask, like why is the chasuble green, right? You don't wanna ask that because you feel like you should know that at this point in your life, but you can go through this and, and, and learn and grow. Um, we wanted to mention um, some of the catechists who, who have been here. Meredith Brewer has been here for 15 years, Lisa Murray for 10. Katie Tuff has assisted at all the levels. Uh, Linda Golly is here, a high school teacher now following the child, huh? Um, Susan Harris and then um, Jessica Cassis, right? Who else did we have? Um, so right. Diane Moore, Diane, yeah, 15 years. Um, and and in um, in the atria, you know, Linda was mentioned. We sort of follow the child, and it's the room's fault. It's not the child's fault. Um, each of the children are given individual attention. Um, the catechist known by name, um, and we may have talked about some of the kids at staff. Like one really is, it's an unruly child, um, and I'm not so, not so sure. It's not the not the the child has something going on, but the question is not, um, the question is not, the, the question is how can we as a church minister and help that child grow regardless of where they are um, in their family life, in their school life, in their, uh, their, their mental health life. Um, it, it really is a very loving um, experience um, in all ways. 
um, a little bit about the history of young families at Trinity by the Cove. It's in our DNA. I mentioned that as the church was started, um, there was a preschool. Um, and that has continued. I heard a story uh, about a couple of months ago um, of the jukebox, which was here, that made the youth group blossom. That was like in the 70s or so. Um, so, you know, catechesis here was brought in 2000. It was Father Michael Bazin, who was the rector who had experienced it up in Indiana. So he was uh, a big devotee to catechesis, and it takes a lot of effort to get catechesis up and running in church. It's a it's a little bit of a cultural shift. Um, and so uh, working with Father Todd, who um, at that time, the idea was to have a, a one of the priests focused on young families. That was Father Todd, then Father Andrew, and then me. Um, and then uh, have a head catechist or a young family coordinator come in. And that was uh, Kathy Sandmeyer, Lisa Richard, Louisiana, Richard, not Richard, Richard, um, uh, Linda Gimmer, then Annie Ross, and then Linda Gimmer again. Um, so, you know, th we had uh, the backbone of catechesis put in. Um, when I got here, um, young families really did grow from 30 to about 100. And that's one of the reasons the vestry wanted to hire me as rector. Um, but one of the ways that we did that is we use this formation as the backbone. Um, but then we added into that um, a lot of the intergenerational activities that you see. So when, when uh, you know, 2008, 2009, Young Family Socials, we had, it was a vibrant, very faithful group. And that's where, Diane, I was looking at some pictures and, some, you know, it was the Walshes, remember? Um, all of these young families, they were a core group. And as I put together Young Family Socials, I knew that if I missed, like, if two families couldn't make it, it was going to be sort of a not great party. Um, I needed full participation. So how do you uh, take that seed and, and help it to, to, to flower? So we used uh, all of the generations gathered. And so that's where you think, see things like the cookie Sunday. You see the fishing tournament. Um, you see some of those other, the Mardi Gras Sunday, all social. So all those were the ways to use the energy in all of the ages to really promote and lift up young families. Um, and it worked pretty well. Um, the other things I would say is just intergenerational when you look at um, Ian. Ian found us cleaning up and we had um, a, lot, a lot of older people coming to help to clean up, but the youth had a huge presence. Um, they were all here shoveling out carpet. One youth who doesn't come to church much, she came and she moved a whole huge thing of carpet this big into the dumpster, uh, one by one. So, um, you know, all the generations gathered has been important. Um, I want Linda to talk about the missional aspect of catechesis here at Trinity, um, because a church the size of Trinity um, has an obligation or a calling uh, to serve not just ourselves, uh, but to serve the wider church and the wider community. Um, you all see that in many ways through the grants we give. Um, some of you on the Finance Commission or Vestry have seen ways we've helped other churches with some of that admin stuff. Um, but Linda's going to share how we do that in formation. So when um, Michael Basson started, there were three atrias in Florida, and one here, one in Miami, and one up in the Panhandle. And because of Trinity by the Cove, we had um, formation courses here. We've had 11 of them here. Um, we have paid for catechists to go to the other ones. And there are over 60 atria in Florida right now. And there are two training centers, one on Largo and one on the East Coast over by Miami. And it's just blossomed. And not just because it's Florida, but because then catechesis, the whole United States has now spread to a place, right? That was before barren almost. And so that community here that gathered to be a little beggar and now have a whole big state of Florida, the, the gatherings are quite special and it's Trinity. We hosted them, we paid for them, we paid for people to go to other ones, and we brought in some fabulous trainers, and because Trinity kept saying yes, because you all kept saying yes, and I put it in the budget, and you kept saying yes, and I was never told no, never, never, and that's 
that's a testament to you and to what your work does. Just, I mean, just being here, right? The support financially, the support in people, the support in um, a faith community, right? This is a faith community. It's not just going to church. And that rubs off on the kids, right? They grow up in that and they become that. And so that's important, not just for us. We want that everywhere. We want that everywhere. And so to send people, even once they've lived here and moved, Lisa Richard, who was trained here, then took it to Texas, and now they have Atria in Texas, it just goes, right? Because it started here. And I, I don't want to brag. I just want you to know that this church has had a huge impact in growing catechesis, especially in Florida. And that's to the thanks of this church. And I want to say one other thing, because I know I'm running out of time. But when we were talking about who's gone through formation, all the priests have been formed in catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So that's one of the things they do when they come here is they, Father Nicholas has, Father Amy, Mother Marcella. I mean, that's an expectation. Is that what I'm saying? An invitation. I'll tell you more. So I, I, Linda has been told no, but I can only think of two times. Um, one was when I came here, um, I wanted to take level one training um, because I thought if I'm going to be involved in this, I really need to understand and know what's going on. Um, and so I signed up to take a level one training and then my workload got really heavy. And I was thinking, I'm not spending enough time with my kids. I'm not spending enough time with Virginia. Something's got to give. And so I said, the whole Saturday where I give to training once a month or whatever it was, I'm done with that. And so I said, uh, Linda, I'm not doing this training anymore. But did she get mad at me? <laughs> she got really mad at me. But um, the, the reason, because she was worried that I wasn't fully invested in catechesis of the Good Shepherd. Um, but I was able to convince her that I was. Um, and it is true that the curates who come through, so our priests, um, uh, Nicholas, Amy, uh, Marcella, um, they've all been, uh, yeah, um, Daniel, they've all been uh, curates, which means they go through a three-year program. Year one, they're learning the basics, um, how to preach, how to preside, um, but they also have to go to level one training in the atria. That's to give them a different uh, view of their seminary education and also hopefully make them fall in love with children's ministry. The second year they do programming, they learn how to run the calendar and how to church this side. The third year is all about administration and fundraising, stewardship. Um, so uh, by the end of those three years, um, they end up with the ability to go out and run a church. Um, now, at the end of those three years, we I sit down with the priests and I discern, do you really want to go run a church? Or is God really calling you to something else? Um, because it's one of my pet peeves in the Episcopal Church that we have this career of starting out, then going to a small church, moderate-sized church, large church, as a rector. And that's the only thing you can do. I think that pigeonholes God. And so I don't like it. So you can see uh, Nicholas, who loves formation. He's here now in another three-year cycle, really focusing on formation because that's what he loves. It's his passion. Um, you see Marcella developing into that love of pastoral care. Um, so it's uh, looking at the individual priest and allowing the room to do the work, right? Um, we, we wanted to share with you what we think um, some of the key um, differences are in a child and youth's faith journey. Um, and you can talk about um, this, but basically it's the parents and the grandparents making formation and church attendance a priority. It is. We have grown not just in size, but in commitment. And that's what I... Um, I smile the most about, right, is so Episcopals aren't known for going to church every Sunday, but we have families who are bringing their church, to the, their children to the atrium every Sunday. Not always, but it grows because they're here. They have a great parental, parent social out in the courtyard. We meet them where they are. We are always here, right? We don't close for anything. We're always here and we know your schedules are busy. And I think that non-guilt acceptance and invitation is freeing. They want to be here. They make it in their calendar to be here. It doesn't always work. And there are other things that come up and that's okay with us. When you're here, your child gets something really wonderful and the catechists grow even more. 
And there are times when mom and dad can't bring them and grandma and grandpa bring them, right? So we have nine grandma and grandpas in this parish that are actively involved with their children. And I know there are a couple more that send things to their grandchildren from here. So I think um, I like that it's growing in that way. And I think um, it's important, not just for the parents and the grandparents and the family members, but the children see you all, right? They see you here, they see you pray, they see you make the sign of the cross that they've learned in the atrium and then they come to church and you're making the sign. They see you, they watch you, they really do. And they love baking co or making cookies with you. So when you show up, that is the best gift you can give the children so that they know they're loved and that you wanna be a part of their life. And that goes from three years old all the way through that youth group and they go on pilgrimage. And they need you. They need someone mentoring them and, and supporting them in a big, big, big way. And this church does that. So I thank you. I'm grateful. And this comes with much gratitude. But keep it up because it does make a difference. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that Linda just mentioned is the importance of what you all do as non-parents and non-grand, as regular parishioners, if you're not singing in church, guess who's watching? The children. And so what do they do? They don't sing in church. If you don't put an electronic giving card into the plate as it passes, or a dollar bill. I know we all give differently. I give, you know, by credit card. Virginia puts in the electronic thing. If they don't see you participating, guess what? They're not going to participate. Um, if they don't see you being nice and kind and smiling and talking to people at coffee hour, guess what? They're going to learn from that. They learn, they're learning right now what a faith community looks like. Um, and that is how you can serve every Sunday. You don't have to have a child on your mind, but do those things that we do because it's worship and it's wonder. Um, and so enough being on a soapbox for that. But those are my two pet peeves, singing, offering plate. Um, and, and then there are other ways that if you really are looking to get involved, you may not want to be a catechist. You, you don't see your time uh, being spent that way on Sunday mornings. We've had people volunteer to help with the children's courtyard in gardening. Um, the Daughters of the King help uh, by doing prayer cards and note cards for the kids to send out. Um, Michelle Bird's uh, dad recently uh, carved all of the crash ornaments that they used on um, Christmas Eve. Um, there's baking cookies. There's all sorts of ways for you all to get involved in the lives of young families. And you all notice, I mean, I have a habit of using the word parish family instead of church or um, faith community, um, because it is all the generations gathered. Um, and in a family, we all know there's, you know, the people we love, the people who really kind of make Thanksgiving a little bit harder. Um, but we're all joined together, right? Because we're a parish family. Um, and when you realize that, um, hopefully you're growing in love with one another. Questions? You have, well, it's 11.02, so you, I'll give you three minutes for questions. Diane. Formation. Um, 
Thank you, Diane. Diane was sharing for those of you online how uh, going through the uh, catechist training or formation really does enliven and enlighten faith journey and understanding about um, Jesus and really everything. Um, the other uh, comment she made is how children are welcome in the services. Uh, if they're crying and making noise, they're still welcome. And you gave me a great opportunity because I'm going to flip it too, which is, you know, we've had some older people in the congregation who, you know, maybe with some cognitive issues and making some noise. Uh, we've had the oxygen machines that, you know, sound like the scuba sets coming. Um, we love them too. Um, and they have equal claim to having us be patient and understanding. Um, a question over here, Barb. Barb was sharing how uh, she's been invited uh, into uh, uh, the atria to, to do some music with her guitar and how that's another way uh, that kids have a touch point in, in worship and music, uh, whether it's the contemporary service with violin uh, and piano and guitar or the greatest instrument known to man, the organ, which we've done organ tours for the kids as, as well. Any other questions, Connie? Connie is sharing that uh, as, a, as an usher, so as someone who really helps during uh, worship, to be able to sure to welcome young families. And all ushers know to hand young kids uh, a my church bag, right? We've been, we've been working on that. Infants in church, it's a lot of fun. Yes? She is. Anything else for the good of the group? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, you gave us the image of the good shepherd, the one who calls us each by name and gathers us into the sheep fold so that we might be uh, safe and with one another. We pray that you would continue uh, to look upon this, your parish family, and gather us together as one, Allow us each to feed the other. Um, and be with us as we learn one another by name, how we can help and love one another, and ever bless the children in this parish family. These prayers we offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Go get them, everybody.